we move so quickly to crucifying desires without asking, why is that desire there? And wondering, is God trying to meet me in that desire? Is that, does, does that lust actually underneath it? Is there a deep longing there um, for God, for intimacy, for friendship that we need to bless? We should curse sin, but we should never curse sin to the detriment of asking why that sin is there. What's the underlying thing? And to bless the godly desire that is underneath that. Welcome to the Conversations Podcast. We're happy that you jumped on today's episode. I have with me Dr. AJ Swoboda. He's a professor at Bushnell University, um, as well at uh, Friends University, I believe. And he's authored so many different books, uh, two of them which I've read, one After Doubt. The other that we're going to talk about is The Gift of Thorn. So I have the privilege to sit down with him and just have a a great conversation on uh, theology of desire and just many more topics like that so we hope you enjoy so we're just excited to have you aj thank you for coming on drew thank you for having me you've set the table i get to come and dine with you what a gift (laughs) awesome thank you for that um yeah honestly uh you're so first and foremost yeah just to even um just talk about how you've uh, I, like I told you before, I heard you in a chapel at Light Pacific when I was there, and um, it was just such an impactful message on Thomas. And um, mm-hmm. one of the things that I actually really love that you said, you're like, I think we need to stop calling Thomas doubting Thomas. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's so funny because even that, even that little sentence alone, just mm-hmm. starts shifting the reality of what what Scripture was really talking about with Thomas. So thank you for that one. Mm. Um, immediately got grabbed your book after doubt, um, which if we have time for, I'd love to chat about that as well. Yeah. Um, just about doubt and deconstruction and, and, um, yeah, such a, such a fruitful book. And then now you just came out with the gift of thorns, um, which I have here, which is absolutely great book. I, um, it was funny cause I feel like after every chapter I read, I would be like, I would I, when I would come back to the book, I would look at him like, man, I just already, I already read so much. Like, I'm already going to finish it. Dang it! <laughs> um, because yeah. it was. This is it, your way of saying it was. It was a. It was a heavier, heavier read. Yes, correct. You're yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, definitely heavier read, and it actually really um, spoke to. And you talk about this in the book, in which I'll ask you. It, it really. Um, spoke to something deep within myself that I don't think I've ever heard anybody else talk about, which is, Mm. which is desire. Um, and, Mm. and coming to this book, I was, I'm definitely one who had the idea of if God can take away desire completely within myself, Mm. then I will finally be what he wants me to be. Mm. And, Mm. and then literally just reading it was, you just shattered that. Um, because mm-hmm. you already start with the book of saying, if God desires and he created us, then we, we have an innate mm-hmm. desire for good things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so out of all of that, just like your heart, obviously your heart behind the book and, and mm-hmm. just like, yeah, just from that place, like what, what was that like mm-hmm. writing this book? Um, yeah, man, uh, I, it was, it's funny. I had somebody, a, a, a very close friend of mine, um, uh, Tony Scarcello, who's actually a pastor here in Eugene. He has a really interesting and beautiful story. He, um, uh, he's a pastor of a, a four square church here in Eugene. Mm. Um, he, uh, has a book coming out about his story. He, um, is married to a beautiful woman, but he spent his life wrestling with, um, same sex attraction. And part of his story is, helping the church understand what that experience is like and, and how to follow Jesus in the midst of that. And he, we were um, sharing coffee uh, together. You know, we, we both hold a very, we're very um, committed to kind of a historic Mm -hmm. reading of sexuality as it relates to the church, historic Orthodox view. And um, we're old fuddy duddies, sort of conservative guys on the topic, but he made, he made a really interesting comment over coffee recently. He said, um, that this particular book, the gift of thorns was as important for him as it was because in his words, whether you're talking about sexuality, 
politics, consumerism, greed, um, abuse, racism, um, injustice. He made the comment that actually this book, uh, which is about desire, is the conversation that's underneath every conversation. Mm-hmm. That it is the bedrock thing underneath everything. Yeah, and I hadn't I hadn't recognized that in the process of writing this book um, because largely um, it, it sounds almost grandiose to make a comment that this is a book about everything, <laughs> but the truth is, desire is underneath everything. Right. Um, it's underneath the story of creation, why God created. Mm-hmm. God did not create because he was compulsively forced to. He didn't have to. He doesn't do it because he needs people to praise him. Um, he creates out of desire. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the the German pietist theologians that I read in this book, I literally, uh, Jacob uh, Bone de- de- describes creation as the concentration of God's desire. Hmm. Um, creation is about desire. Our sexuality is about desire. Our bodies uh, are desiring, you know, entities, everything. Mm -hmm. So what was it like? Um, It was a hard process. This book took years to write. Um, Many tears, many failures, Mm -hmm. many, um, you know, those classic moments when you write a chapter and then you rip it up and you toss it in the can and you start all over again. I can't tell you how many, how full my trash can was, (laughs) my (laughs) digital trash can, as it were. Um, it was a hard project, but at the end of the day, Drew, um, this is the book that is about everything. It is about yeah. everything in our life. And uh, I am wildly grateful that my publisher supported it and that yeah. there has been a really uh, welcome reception to the text. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, and I love that. I love, uh, well, I, one of the things that I really gravitate towards specifically your writing and even your sermons is that you, you do come out of a place of vulnerability. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's not a place that, that is, um, well, I feel like it's twofold, right. For authors and pastors, it's like, oh, I can be vulnerable for the, the hook Mm -hmm. sake just, just to, just to grab you so you can buy a book, buy my book, or I'm vulnerable because this has been such a, a, a longing in my heart. Uh, mm. to to really seek the heart yeah. of Jesus and to really become like him. And so because of that, clearly when you have Jesus fully in your heart, you you can't contain that that as well. And so I love that about you because I feel like, yeah, when I was reading this book, I was like, oh, you're you 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 were definitely more vulnerable mm. um mm. than I I haven't Sorry to say, I haven't read your other books yet, um, but I, I will. It's okay. My wife hasn't either. I've written 12 books and my <laughs> yeah. wife has only written, read like three of them. So Drew, yeah. you, you're actually on par. You're doing great. Okay, cool. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you're doing great. But I can definitely tell from After Doubt to this one, I'm like, oh, you you really stepped into a, a, a mm. place where you're not just um, writing for writing's sake or or writing for for um, essentially a paycheck. You, you are like, no, oh. this is, this is what God has placed on my heart, which I, yeah, I just, I love that about you. And I love that, that, that really comes out of it is that, yeah, this book, this book really is about everything, you know, and, and just how, mm-hmm. how you understand the things that you want and understand the things that you don't want, but you still pursue, you know, like getting to the root of that. You have a line that I, I just want to quote, cause I, I love it. And you say, desire can actually be a signpost to the places in our souls that most need love. What Mm. we assume to be a reservoir of lust may actually be a longing for intimacy. Mm -hmm. And you, I think that like is the the signpost and the door opening to the rest of your book because we long for intimacy. The the context um, drew of that particular um, quote um, is actually um, in in one of the introductory chapters where I talk about um, uh, addiction to porno- uh, pornography. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a really excellent um, psychotherapist, Christian psychotherapist by the name of Jay Stringer, mm-hmm. who wrote wrote a book um, about uh, sexual desire a number of years ago, um, and it's called Unwanted, which is a f- an absolutely incredible book. But he talks about how you know, we tend to, in the, in the church, rightfully, we see pornography as, as, you know, it's, it's not good. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, um, to, to be a consumer of pornography, to objectify people, um, sexually is a sin and, and it, and it needs to be rightfully called a sin. But Stringer in his book, he, he, and in his teachings, he often talks about how we almost always 
look at the desire for say sexual gratification or, 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 or pornography, we immediately jump to, um, calling it sin without asking the question, why do we, why do we actually want this? Mm-hmm. Why is it that our hearts want to look at something like this? And th- this is actually where his work's been really helpful for me and, and in, in terms of helping my students understand the, the gravity of pornography is that very often our, our sexual desires are tied to places in our childhood where we did not experience love. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he actually, I mean, in, in many respects, he did an interview um, in, in which I heard where he, he talks about how um, often the kinds of pornography that somebody is interested in or, or gravitated towards, you can often connect that to childhood trauma mm-hmm. and things that were not you know, settled as, as a child. Mm-hmm. Why do I bring this up? Um, we move so quickly to crucifying desires without asking, why is that desire there? And wondering, is God trying to meet me in that desire? Is that, is that, does, does that lust actually underneath it? Is there a deep longing there um, for God, for intimacy, for friendship that we need to bless? Mm-hmm. We, we should curse sin, but we should never curse sin to the detriment of asking why that sin is there. What's the underlying thing? And, and to bless the godly desire that is underneath that. There is nothing wrong with desiring intimacy. There is nothing wrong with desiring friendship. There's nothing wrong with desiring being known. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing d- wrong with desiring sexual union, union with somebody. Um, unfortunately, those desires become perverted into what Paul calls the flesh. Um, mm-hmm. But we need to get to the good desire to be able to understand why it's become perverted. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And that was beautifully said. Um, yeah. And even on that, why have we in, I mean, you could say Christianity in the West or just Christianity in general have avoided the topic of desire and mm. why is it something that has been so, it's either you, you kill it of what you were saying, like yeah. you, you kill it as a whole and somebody who grew up that way, it only makes it worse and just da- more damaging um, yeah. to the soul. But also, yeah, why, like, why would you say that? desire is not talked about so yeah. much yeah. in Christianity. Well, um, so a little history here. Um, mm. This is not a new phenomenon, Drew, mm. in terms of um, our desire to just want to kill all desire. That's not a new, that's not a new thing. In fact, um, if, if you go back to some of the earliest moments in the, in the, in the Christian church, we see, we see this tendency kind of afoot right away. For example, we see it in the story of a guy named Origen. Uh, Origen was an early Christian um, theologian. He was later deemed a heretic, and rightfully so for, for a number of reasons. But early on, uh, he was considered one of the greatest preachers in the early church. And Origen had, uh, we're, we're told, because of his preaching, he had all these people flocking to hear him preach. And a number of the women, the people that were coming to f- hear him preach were women that he uh, found to be um, sexually desirous. And Origen uh, decided to undertake a pretty radical attempt to undo his <laughs> desire. Um, he took the words of Jesus and Matthew in, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And he went to the full extent to uh, castrate himself. <laughs> Um, now, it, now, peop- scholars who study origin would be very quick to point out that it's that it's evident that later on in his life, he he sort of rejected the fact that he did this. He he resented it. He could, kind of realized he sh- probably shouldn't have done this. Um, but what that story represents is, I think, uh, an impulse mm-hmm. uh, in many Christians that we would rather have no desires than have healed desires. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason, Drew, that we would rather have no desires rather than healed desires is because it, 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 it it takes care of the problem immediately. And we don't have to wrestle with Mm -hmm. the the long-term formation of having to wait and trust in God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm 43, Drew, and I have been following Jesus now for coming up on 30 years and many of the same desires Mm -hmm. that I struggled with at 16 years old, I still wrestle with today at 43 and you could go, is that a failure of discipleship? 
a failure of formation? Absolutely not. What's different is I have the capacity now to handle those desires and know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. But when I was 15, I had no idea what to do with them. (laughs) Now I do. The Holy Spirit now is stronger than those Mm -hmm. desires in my life. And I'm able to say no, Mm -hmm. what Paul calls crucifying the flesh. I'm able to say no now because of the strength of the Holy Spirit. So that's coming up in 30 years, bro. And (laughs) I'll tell you, there have been times that I was like, I just wish I had no desire at all and just cut it all out. But I got to tell you. Um, The struggle of 30 years of wrestling with my desires has actually been the altar where Christ Mm -hmm. has met me. And I wouldn't replace it for a moment because it's made me who I am. As Paul would say, um, the thorn in my side uh, has been a gift from God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. Um, Yeah. I think a lot of us who have grown up like that haven't quite heard that be put Mm -hmm. in this way. Um, which I think is, is healing, but I also think it, it brings, uh, uh, um, the reality of, yeah, I would rather cut my desires because it's quick. It's easy. I don't have to, I don't have to wrestle with anything. I don't have to go through the process of facing the reality of what's, what's deep down, what's, what's hiding me from, um, what's hiding me from what I really want to do, um, and to find Jesus. And what I love is that you, you talk about in the book, how God and how God is invitational to those parts of your heart, to those, to those desires. Um, and then you quote A.W. Tozer of God is waiting to be wanted. And just that, I, that, that idea of understanding, cause I, I feel like, I grew up as a pastor's kid, um, yep. uh, and I grew up uh, assemblies of God, like all all through that denomination. And so, um, it's been great. It's beautiful. Uh, not trying to bash it at all, but just you know, context of of how I grew up. And so, I have never heard that God wanted me, or at least mm-hmm. that was never really preached or told. I, I'm thankful for a father and a mom that that told me that, but going to church and realizing like that aspect of like, no, 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 God, God actually wants you. And he had a desire to create you. And out of that, you have a desire for him. It's just been convoluted by so much of the world um, and so much evilness. So yeah, I don't know if your comments just on, on the, on that, that God wants us mm-hmm. is already shattering. I think a lot of, of false pursuits, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, For any of us, Drew, thank you for your vulnerability and sharing part of your story and and kind of your upbringing in in, in terms of, um, in terms of what you experienced Mm -hmm. as, as, as a, as a, as a child. Um, uh, One of the biggest uh, griefs or, or, or levels of sadness or I'm slow to use the word trauma because I, I yeah. think we can overuse that language. Oh, and, for sure. And by overusing it, we undermine the importance of that mm. word for certain t- big T traumas. Yeah. But, but one of my deepest, you know, sadnesses in life um, was this lasting sense as a child that I was unwanted by my father. Mm. Uh, my dad uh, was uh, an alcoholic, uh, although he's been clean for you know, 35 years now. And I'm, I'm, awesome. I'm wildly proud of him. Um, but my dad as a, as a young man, when he had me was not in a place where he was emotionally and physically and psychologically ready to have a, a child. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the result is that, um, when my parents went through a divorce at 11 and he left, moved uh, away, um, it left this sense in me as a child that I was uh, unwanted and, mm-hmm. and that, that unwantedness, that sense of feeling uh, unwanted by a man um, actually was what set up much of my, uh, much of, much of my struggle as an adult. Um, Mm. I joke, it's not a joke. Uh, This is, I'm going to tell you right now, one of my greatest uh, temptations in life. uh, And I, (laughs) it's almost embarrassing saying this, like giving language to it. I don't know if I've ever said this before um, in an, in an interview, but my, one of my greatest temptations is the, um, is, is, is the, w- the power of being wanted to speak somewhere. Mm. 
when I receive a speaking invitation. It has such profound power in my heart, largely due to the fact that it is filling a hole that was not filled Mm -hmm. as a child. I am wanted. I am wanted by somebody because I'm valuable, I'm needed, and I'm wanted for something. Mm -hmm. The problem for me is that often I can use my gift of communication as a means to emotionally fill myself up. Mm -hmm. And so I bastardize, I almost pimp out my gift Mm -hmm. in order to feel wanted. And that's a very dangerous place to be. Becoming a Christian, I get to wake up every day, Drew, and know that I am wanted by God. Mm -hmm. And it is only by being wanted by God that I don't have to be wanted by everybody. Mm -hmm. If I don't understand how wanted I am by God, I will have to fill up that hole with other people. Mm. But when I know how wanted by God I am, I am free to not have to live from speaking invitation to speaking invitation. Yeah. So it's a very critical idea. um, How wanted we are not just loved. We are Mm. actually wanted. God wants us. He desires us. He longs for us. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And excuse me. um, Yeah. Just on that topic, I feel like obviously I'm I'm quick to be somebody who says we don't do this enough in in church or we don't do this enough in 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 Christianity and um so in a way trying to shuffle through that imbalance because the church is good and the church is needed mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but at the same time uh that invitation to know that God wants us and he is inviting us yeah. um totally shifts my desire from wanting things that that are invitational, but they are they are um, weightless. They're 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 only things that are filled with with yeah. um, shame and 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 guilt and and all of those things that can make us unidentified by Jesus. Um, that distort that. And now we're shifting. I want to shift that focus to somewhere where I know once once I'm hugged by God by my heavenly Father. Well, man, I want that every day. Yeah. Um, and I think I think you are spot on in in your book. And thank you also for being vulnerable and, and talking about that as as well, because I think that'll speak volumes to to many people who are struggling with with. I mean, either with speaking engagements or just in general. Just yeah. What am, what am I doing to you, you could get that Drew? You could you could you could translate that to the person who gives themselves sexually over and over and over mm-hmm. to people on, you know, Tinder or whatnot. Why for a fleeting moment to feel wanted? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, w- why do we constantly say yes to everybody without having good boundaries? Because yeah. we want to continue to be wanted. Right. I mean, it, it really does reframe our entire existence. Yeah. If we have a deep sense of belovedness before mm-hmm. God, to the degree that we know how beloved we are by God, mm-hmm. we are free to not have to live in in the oppression mm-hmm. that comes with constantly feeling like we need to be wanted by 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 everybody. Yeah. So you know, unfortunately, in history, we know um, whole people groups have been uh, have experienced oppression and even murder as a result of mm-hmm. not being wanted. I mean, what what did the Nazis call the Jews? The undesirables. Mm-hmm. Um, we call them unwanted children. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, it's it, unfortunately in the realm of like abortion. Um, it's only a child if I want it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, you know, that that's evil. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. because a, a child is not a child because it's wanted. A child is a child because it's a child. Yeah. Um, so, so God, we are not valuable. Um, but to God, because of what we produce, we're valuable because of who we are yeah. and, and we are wanted because we are God's mm. creations. So yeah. that, that reframes everything. I mean, it just, <laughs> it changes the way you understand your life, the way you operate socially with other people. It's a, mm. it, it really is a game, game changer. Oh yeah, definitely. I am one of those people where I was like, whoa, I have to, this is, you're putting language to how I feel or, or these longings that I've always, always thought were wrong. 
And now I'm seeing that it's the invitation to realize that I'm wanted mm-hmm. by God and God wants me and he yeah. wants to be wanted. Yeah. Um, I think it flips the whole, um, you know, why is God so jealous? Why is he so all this stuff? Cause he's power hungry <laughs> and, and this whole <clears throat> way of thinking of God just wants to be an authoritative figure, um, power of the cosmos, you know, just mm-hmm. like yeah. brings down the hammer or when, when we realize that shift of we are his belovedness yeah. and then he wants us yeah. totally, totally just takes off that caricature yes. of him. Yes. Um, and now we have the reality of, of our father. Um, something I think you, you preach on this before about going back to Genesis in, in the garden and when, after Adam and Eve obviously have uh, the you know the great fall, and when God shows up, He shows up for a walk, mm-hmm. and He doesn't scold them. He doesn't mm-hmm. He doesn't do anything. He He just shows for that regular routine walk to be with them, to be in their presence. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's significant, even after reading your book. And I've been doing um, a lot of of I, I guess you'd say studying on on holiness and. God's presence. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you had this process of your book, but thinking of Genesis of God just wanting to be present with, with his, with his children. Um, and then desire all of the, all of it throughout your book. Did you, did you realize that there's kind of a theme of holiness throughout mm-hmm. of it? I don't know if you, if you thought about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember any moment uh, in the writing of the book where I, I had a cognitive awareness that mm-hmm. this is about holiness. But now that you, now that you bring that up, um, you, you know, one, one of the, now that you bring it up, one, one of the themes of the book is, is that embracing the light, the Christian life is, is making space for the Holy spirit who Paul says searches all things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's true searches all things. That's not just like the stuff on the outside. That's the inside stuff. That's like the deep cavernous subterranean stuff in our hearts. The Holy spirit searches our search histories. Mm -hmm. The Holy spirit searches, you you know, our, 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 the way we think about others, the way that we, um, look at people when we walk down the street, the Holy spirit searches all things. Um, and, and if that's true, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of truth, mm-hmm. if that's true, there's no part of our existence um, in which God is not simultaneously aware of mm-hmm. our brokenness and simultaneously desiring that brokenness to be healed. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the truth is God's desire for our lives is to be restored to our original design, our, our manufactured, you know, our, 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 the, the way that we were meant to be. Mm. And that means that the spirit, Paul says in Romans eight, the spirit groans mm. uh, until we are fully revealed as the restored sons and daughters of God that we, God wanted us to be. Mm. So I have a whole new, I guess, appreciation even here in, in talking to you in, in terms of seeing how um, the spirit of God that longs for that restoration to happen is Mm -hmm. almost suffering inside of us until that day groaning, Mm -hmm. I mean, crying out, which is image of a mother giving birth. Uh, It's painful image. Mm -hmm. So the spirit is like bringing holiness to us, Yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a groaning process. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I love the way you said that it's a groaning process. And again, just goes back to God wanting us and, Mm -hmm. And being able to step down and and just to mm-hmm. long but suffer with us in our sufferings, mm-hmm. um, in whatever whatever we're doing, whatever our distorted desires are, are going through, we're able to step in that. He's able to step in that and and mm-hmm. and and cry for us, and and which is which is huge because again, it's it's not necessarily have we, have we heard that or we just hear, hear about uh, obviously the suff- suffering Christ and which is, which is huge. I'm not denouncing that at all, um, mm-hmm. but to know that even in our suffering, even in our, our longings to know that his, his presence is there yes. also. 
yeah. also longing for that, also suffering for that. Yes. Um, there was, I, I don't know what page it was, but you, you talk about that, like the, the desire to be in his presence outweighs every other desire. Um, mm. and, and how we need to, we need to look for that place. Um, I really, yeah, I really love that, that you pretty much talk about that. His, his presence is, is pretty much exactly what we long for. Um, and just to be, just to be in his arms. Okay. I want to do kind of a quick shift, uh, <clears throat> and talk about, um, you talk about the great reversal. Um, and I, I love that you did. It was funny cause our, our pastor here talked about it. And then I, it, I think it was like a week later. And then I read towards the end, I think it was chapter three or four. Um, and you talk about the great reversal and you just, yeah. you, the way you can see scripture is pretty, well, one, it's impressive to me. Um, and it's like, man, I want to step in that place. Cause I could tell it's, it's out of a place of spending time in scripture, spending time with Jesus mm. in, in all this stuff. But yeah, can, can you just touch up on the great reversal specifically in John, the way you just lay that out um, yeah. with the wedding ceremony? Um, yeah. I just love the way you yeah. did that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I d- Drew, I don't want to give the book away. I mean, the yeah, truth true, is everybody's got to yeah. go read the thing. That is and true. the truth <laughs> is the prose in that section, um, I, I gave a lot of time and energy to because I wanted it to be v- attended to a- appropriately. Um, yeah. But the, the big idea is that um, is that pretty much all of... There, there are these key moments in John's gospel in particular, all the gospels do them, but mm. in the, in the gospel of John, where it's very clear, John, who is telling the story of Jesus's death and resurrection. It's very clear that he's been reading the book of Genesis because mm. the way that he tell cast the story is the reversal of mm. some very key events in Genesis one, two, and three. I'll give you just one of them. Yeah. Um, a, a, a great example of this would be that, um, the very first image that we have in the creation story of of God in the garden, in Eden, in the place of delight, the very first image we have is God is planting trees. Now, at at first sight, most sort of Westerners wouldn't think much about that because we don't. Most of us don't grow our own trees and our own fruit. Mm -hmm. But what is that? I mean, if you, if you're growing your own trees, what does that make you? It makes you a gardener. Mm -hmm. So the very first image that we have of God in, in the Bible, in, in, in in the garden of Eden is as a gardener. Mm -hmm. He's planting trees. So that's our first image. God is a gardener. (laughs) So when John is telling his resurrection story in, in, in John 20, um, he, he tells of this woman, Mary, who goes to the tomb er, very early on the seventh day, so Sunday morning, and she shows up, walks into the tomb, and the tomb is empty, and she is befuddled. Where is Jesus, the one she loved? And she comes out, and she's surprised to find this man standing outside the tomb who she didn't know. He's unrecognizable. And so he's standing right outside the tomb and she starts a conversation with this unknown guy, of course, right, not, not seeing because it's early in the morning that it's Jesus, but she doesn't mm-hmm. know that. And John doesn't miss a beat because the very, he, it says she, she comes out of the tomb and, and it goes, thinking he was the gardener, which m- most kind of Easter preachers get really down on her. Like she was wrong. Mm-hmm. She wasn't wrong. Yeah. The, the gardener's back. Mm. And, um, and, and the very, so it's not a mistake. The very first image you have in the first garden mm. is God gardening. Mm. And the very first image you have of God in, in the, the garden tomb is as a gardener. And the minute he says her name, Mary, she knows who it is. It's Jesus. Um, and the rest is history. And, and theologians have often joked, not joked, but made the case that the moment that she, he says the word Mary is the moment in history that we go from CE common era to, uh, to from BCE to CE mm-hmm. from AD to, you know, the year of our Lord. Um, that was the moment in history. And so, you know, and people like James, the brother of Jesus picked this up too. And James one, he says, 
um, humbly receive the word that God has planted in you. Mm -hmm. God is described as a a gardener. So this is not, you know, isolated to just those two. But the point here, Drew, is that when you take the, the, the paradigm of reading the Gospels through the lens of the creation story, there are some wild reversals. And you're going to have to go read chapter 2 and 3 of The Gift of Thorns to figure those out because there's a, a bunch of them, but some really exciting stuff. Yeah, no, totally. And that, I mean, yeah, that alone makes me, I need to reread the book again because it, it really was um, yeah. phenomenal. Just the, those tie-ins that I really love mm-hmm. that you do. And um, yeah, sorry, I probably, I get giddy on all of that. So get, I'm like, get giddy, brother. I, get I giddy. I'm with it. you. I'm with you. I'm <laughs> in yes. solidarity with your giddiness. Yeah, yeah. Because I want everybody to pick up this book, obviously. Um which I hope they do. Um, I'll make it a requirement for the church. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, but last few before before we close, yeah. um, one thing I definitely do want to ask you is: is you talk about desire and duty, um, and I love I love oh, that yeah. that section. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because again, growing up, I definitely have had more moments than, than desiring God. I had more moments Mm -hmm. not desiring God. Um, Mm -hmm. and yeah, I feel like just your thoughts on new believers. I grew up obviously Pentecostal and I know, I know you did as well in our, our, our Pentecostal. Um, and so I definitely grew up seeing so many people encounter Mm -hmm. God Mm -hmm. in service on a, on a, I mean, everything's loud, you know, Um, and and they're amazing moments and obviously God is there. But then the next week, that person who was transformed in that moment, who is now seeking and desiring God, the next week desires the same old things. And even even speaking on people who like me, who've who've grown up in church or grown up in Christianity and just had seasons where I'm like, I don't desire this. And so just, yeah, just your thoughts on, on that of desire. Oh, I'm so glad you connected with that section uh, as well. Cause that was one of my favorite sections in the whole, in the whole book. Um, yeah, you know, uh, there's this beautiful, it's, it's a pretty dense read and I, I'm not Mm. necessarily recommending it, but it's just to make reference to it. There's a book by Janet Hagberg and Robert Gulick called the critical journey. And it's a book Mm. about spiritual. It's basically a book about how we are spiritually formed. Mm. How are people developmentally spiritually formed? And they talk in that book uh, about a concept that's been widely uh, repeated by a lot of people called the wall. And the wall is this, is that you begin the journey of following God and you, you, you say, yes, you, you know, you begin following Christ. And then at some point down the road, you hit this wall and the wall is maybe disappointment, loss of desire, um, a, a major heartbreak, trauma, um, a lost promise, something you thought that you were going to get that you didn't get. And, and it, when you hit the wall, often one of those experiences is you stop wanting God. And, you know, when, when you think about that idea of the wall, we've all, most of us, if you follow Jesus for longer than a couple of years, you've hit the wall at some point, because that is a critical moment in our journey with Christ is, is hitting the wall. You've got to hit the wall mm-hmm. um, because only in hitting the wall can your true desires for God actually be realized. You can't, yeah. um, you can't truly know until you hit the wall. If you really, um, if you really desire to live life with God, mm-hmm. um, well, there's two. I, th- I think that I think it's fair to say that most of us will need to go through two conversions. The first mm-hmm. conversion is when we want to follow God, and the second conversion is following God when we don't want to. Mm-hmm. And that is what we call this duty. Mm-hmm. Is duty is uh, when we choose to follow God not out of desire, but out of discipline, out of um, the will, not because of desire. And and this is actually very important because if our marriage, think about a marriage. If we only f- love our spouse, <laughs> if we only love our spouse on the days that we really feel like it, our marriage is going to be pretty bad. Um, because the truth is, uh, we're going to be on six days a week, off one day a week. You don't love a person just because you want to. Yeah. You are committing in covenant to love that person even on the days that you don't, till death yeah. do, do his part. And we need to apply that same sort of covenantal understanding to our relationship with God because there are going to be days that we don't want to love God. And that is a party, pretty normal part of covenant life with God. Duty is when we follow Jesus, even when we don't have those desires. Mm-hmm. So I describe in the book how 
the, the two hands of discipleship are duty and desire. Mm. There are days that we want to follow God, and there are days that we don't. And we choose to follow God, whether the desire is there or it is not. Mm. And we need a deeper understanding of love than just if I feel about it, if I feel yeah. like I want it today. Yeah. Yeah. Then that's, that's powerful and will help so many people um, not fall into the trap of, well, I don't desire, so I'm going to just walk away yes. fully. Um, which is so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're coming to a close. So I just want to say thank you, uh, AJ. Thank you for being here. Thank you for this very, very fruitful conversation. And um, yeah, I'm going to, I recommend all your books uh, all the time, even the ones I haven't read yet. You're awesome. Um, and You're so awesome. I'm always like, hey, can guys, I make a recommendation? I yes. do have um, a, a, and people have found this to be very, very helpful. Oh yes. Uh-huh. I have a Thursday, um, yeah. A devotional that comes out every yeah. week called the low level theologian. Maybe you can plop that into the show notes, but it's a, I'd love to. Um, it's a weekly devotional. I just know a lot of people are looking for just good, helpful theological content yes. to get through. Um, mm. and, and I've found that that's, that's been very helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Cause I was going to uh, mention that cause I love it. When you started talking about the wall, I was like, Oh, yes. yeah, I remember yeah. you, you wrote yeah. about that. And yeah. Um, yeah, I love, yeah. I love those uh, just love your pastoral heart. Um, yeah, and I love, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And so, yeah, gift of thorns, AJ, obviously I already, I'm already assuming that people are like, you need to have them back on. So I'm already saying it here. Future conversations will happen. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, it. but yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate you. And, uh, yeah, hopefully Thanks see you soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Bro. Of course.